they're welcome to thermodynamics. There are some of uh, your uh, cohort here can't be here, so I'm uh, recording this uh, lecture. Um, well, let me start with this. This is thermodynamics, which thermo is like temperature, right? And dynamics is heat, motion, heat in motion. So it's kind of about, it's about what happens with, we're going to talk a lot about steam, power plant kind of thing, uh, engine cycles, uh, how we model those sort of things. But the first half of the course is going to get familiar with um, how how we measure those things. What are the different uh, properties? Uh, internal energy, enthalpy. I used to hate enthalpy. Now it's my friend. I'll uh, we'll try and make it your friend too. But <clears throat> so, what is this all about? Well, here's here's some thermodynamics in action. Don't panic. Just don't panic. Just follow these instructions. One. Don't faint. Two. Run a clock on your tap and bring it out. Three, cover the pan and then wait until it's cooled right down. Don't try and move the pan, and whatever you do, don't throw water over the fire. That's thermo and dynamic, called flashover. What's going on there? How is it this little fire in in the oil suddenly explodes? You put water on it. What's water do? Water. Burn. Doesn't water weigh more than oil, so it basically forces the oil to go up, which is the fuel source, which makes it climb? There's a bit of that. It's, it's beyond that, though. Water is heavier, and it sinks. But what happens to water when you pour it into a pot of oil that's it's a 350 degrees it Fahrenheit? Oils, it flashes, flashes to steam and goes in as a liquid, and as it sinks, it's heating up. And finally, it gets to the point of going to steam. It says, ah, I think I'll expand. And how much does it expand? If you do the details, um, one liter of water is a kilogram. A kilogram of an ideal gas is about a cubic meter. There's a thousand liters in a cubic meter, so roughly it's going to expand a thousand times. If it expands a thousand times, it also then takes the oil with it. And now the oil is the reason the whole pan wasn't exploding was the limit to the oxygen it had to combust with. It needs the fuel, it needs the temperature, it needs the oxygen to make it go. And what happened when you put the water in the oil pan is it threw the oil out. Now all oil's all in droplets and it's exposed to the air. And it was that's a steam explosion that's fueling a, uh, a burn. So anyway, yeah, that's don't do this. I when I was a kid, I made. Bacon. I was like five years old. Decided to make bacon for my parents in the morning, and uh, I discovered this pan. There's this pan. You know, you know what like a broiler pan is. It's got this top of those holes. Well, by the time the bacon, I put it on the burners, and I wanted the bacon to like. I thought it was genius that the oil would drip right out of the bacon. The bacon would be nice and crisp, and it'd be all separated. But what happened was, by the time the bacon on the top of the pan was hot enough to start. Uh, the, bait, the grease starts burning out of it, it dripped down onto the pan underneath, which is getting close to red hot. And I was five years old or six or ten, nine, whatever it was. Yeah, it did one of the, it didn't do that. My dad did the trick with, he got the Sunday paper and he took the comics, which are my favorite part of the paper, <laughs> and got them wet. And the, why, why would you wet down a piece of paper to put it over a fire? Make it not catch fire as easy so that it smothers it out. Because the water has to change phase and it absorbs heat while, and by the time you're done, then it's so he's able to put pet paper over the fire by getting it wet first. Um, yeah. So Um, no, we're done with that. There's some good ones uh, I found on backdraft too. So, um, while we're on the subject, 
what's what's a backdraft in a fighting a fire somewhere? Anyone know? There's a movie about it. It's when uh, uh, too much oxygen too quickly is introduced. Yeah, and and usually what happens is you have a fire going. It's smoldering. The smoke that you see is incomplete combustion. It will burn. In fact, if 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 you ever um, put out a candle, you know, you, you snuff out a candle and then it gets this sort of smoke coming out. That's what's burning in a candle is the wax is vaporizing and the vapor is burning. When you snuff it out, it's still hot and it makes this smoke coming up. It's 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 combustible. If you take a mat or, or a flame source and take it up, you know, the top of that thing, it'll go and right back and restart it. I will have to do that. But you know, smoke is 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 un, incomplete combustion. So there's some great pictures of uh, on of this backdrafts where there'd be a fire going and it's, it's kind of burning this way and always something changes. Somebody opens a door and now there's the draft going the other way and all the smoke comes out and it makes this big thing of smoke and all of a sudden the fire catches up with the smoke and it literally explodes because the fire's going at, at the, the rate at which it can propagate through the fuel and it, and as the flame changes the fuel into energy, it expands, just like ideal gas law. And it literally, you get this explosive thing. That's one of the things that, so you get this backdraft, blows out smoke, and then the, the, the flame catches up to it, and all of a sudden, kaboom. And it's, it happens unpredictably if you're fighting fire. So that's why you don't want to be just a rookie trying to go put out a fire if you don't really have a sense. But now you're all experts. So, uh, I still don't think I'm as good as my friend who did a forest firefighting for 15 years. Yeah, probably not. So again, welcome to thermodynamics. Uh, we won't be doing any experiments that look like those pictures, um, but uh, we're going to look at, at the uh, properties of things. This is this. I I guess I should apologize ahead of time for um, there will be piles of homework. I tried to keep it to sort of like 10 problems that you had to crank numbers on per week-ish. We're going to go through a bunch of chapters. There's also going to be questions um, that that are I didn't count into that 10 that are just like, you should be reading the book or at least scanning it for the important stuff. And some of those questions point to the topics that I think are we especially want to like be thinking about. So when I so there's problems. Um, there's numbers and there's a number with an e on it. That means it's English units. We're going to be doing both English and metric units. Um, there's problems that have a c on it. That's a concept problem. That's that's one where um, basically that's a concept I want you to, to be focused on in your reading. That's why it's there. But uh, yeah, I, I would apologize for that, but this is really what it takes to get through this talk. This is this is one of the basic, um, you know, the, the mechanical engineering is is about making machines machines move. So there's engines and things that cause them to move, and the energy how we analyze the engines, and then there's the metallurgy and the the how you uh, make parts and how you uh, test them for strength and all that. There's sort of the material side and there's the energy side. This is the root of the energy side. The metallurgy and your machining are kind of the root of that that uh, material side. Uh, so I have posted the syllabus, um, and at the bottom of the syllabus is the schedule. How many people have have looked on Canvas for that stuff yet? Those of you who haven't. Uh, that's your next pass. Uh, I loaded in Canvas. I'm not like the super whiz kid on this stuff, so it's all in the modules. And each each module for each chapter, there's a module for the syllabus. There's a module for each lab. If there's additional information, um, uh, I will add that to whatever's appropriate. Generally, the lab. If there's there's another piece of of information for the lab, a resource, a reference. Uh, I will add that to the lab. You don't necessarily need to print everything out, 
but it, uh, for instance, for the labs, uh, there's a lab tomorrow, and it's it's going to uh, expect you to go print out the assignment for the lab and bring that. Um, so that's the labs. There's also a tab for additional resources. Some stuff I threw in there that might be useful. Again, you don't have to print it out. It's there if you need it. Um, so under um, Canvas, if it worked according to how I intended it to work, when you open up the page, it should just have all those modules listed as, as folders. They call them modules. Basically, it's a folder for each chapter. And what I'm going to do is for each chapter, uh, these notes are reproduced in six, six slides per page. They'll be available. Uh, I see some of you have those already. Um, I do that so that you can print them out. And instead of taking notes all along, and, and then I would, like I used to end up with this jumble of notes that I couldn't make sense out of. But the fact that I wrote them down helped them get in my head. But if you print out the, the pages, then you can come and just highlight. Instead of writing a sentence about something, you can just do a circle around it. And, you know, it, Hopefully, it helps you with your note taking. There will be notes. Um, you have all the solutions to the, the problems, also posting solutions to your problems. Not just so that you can copy them, because when the test comes, if you copy the solution, you won't know how to start the problems in the test. So the idea is try the problem. If you get stuck, go look and see what the solution is. If you didn't get stuck, you got to the end, you can use those to see what the answer is. But use those as a resource to help you. Uh, you know, not, it's, I don't want this to be a mystery. Uh, this this topic. I had a hard time in thermodynamics in the way back days. I'm not sure why. Um, I mean, I, I, I have ideas why, but I'm going to try and make it not a hard thing for you guys. So I'm going to, you'll have the notes, you'll have the answers. And if I do an example up here, I'm going to do it on a piece of paper. When I get done with the chapter, I'm going to scan all those and I'm going to post those to, uh, to the the page also to the whichever uh, folder it is. So those will be your resources that you use. Tests will be open, open book, open notes, open your notes, not necessarily open like you know, no lifelines, um, because you need to know this stuff. This this if you end up with a job using these things, um, they expect that you know what you're doing. My first half of my my industrial career was working on little electronic things, and thankfully I had nothing to do with thermodynamics, which suited me fine because I didn't feel confident about it. But then I decided to start a business, and I started a brewery. <laughs> Is there any thermodynamics involved in a brewery, designing a brewery, a microbrewery that has steam-powered brew kettles and heating and all that? And maybe some refrigeration. That's what we're studying: refrigeration and, and steam power and stuff. I had, at, you know, I think the difference was when I was in class, I didn't see the, how useful is steam power. I mean, really, they, you don't see steam locomotives anymore. So, do we use it anywhere? <clears throat> do we use it for plain old straight-ahead heat. Uh, not for hydro, that's going to be the fluids class. Anyone ever hear of a nuclear power plant? That's steam powered. Nuclear is just the fire for it. It's completely steam turbines. Um, anyone hear of a coal-fired power plant? Like 70% of the, the electricity is coal-fired. That's steam turbines being turned by a coal fire. So uh, it's used a lot industrially. Um, it's, it hasn't gone away. It's, it's pretty magic uh, the way those things work. So it isn't as, and then and again, you know, industrial, uh, this entire building, the entire campus is heated by steam. We're going to see the central boiler plant as one of our labs. It's also a central refrigeration plant. They, all, the, all the cold. The, the water in your, uh, I'm not sure, if, I don't, they're probably not the, like the water 
the drinking fountains. But all the air conditioning and all of the heat comes from pipes distributed throughout campus from one plant that's over that side of campus. It's also the largest tank in the county is a thermal battery. It's just cold water storage for the air conditioning. Um, so, you know, it's the steam is used a bunch of different places. And uh, it's, I think part of the problem I had relating was who uses this stuff anymore anyway? Well, not in your house necessarily, but in industry, it's really common. Um, so, homework format. I'll have to double check. Um, you probably, how many people have already taken uh, statics and such? And the rest of you are probably taking it, or probably should be. Um, there's a format, and we, we're looking for um, It's called engineering computation paper. It's sort of this green stuff with a back printed grid. Um, you're going to be doing enough homework staring at stuff. It saves your eyes. Um, there's a format. You'll find that that's just commonly, for a lot of practical reasons, that's used commonly um, in engineering. And you may have some in professors that expect to have only one problem per page. There's a format to it um, that I've posted, but basically it's, you, you know, which problem you're working on, free body diagram or a drawing or something to help you organize your thoughts on what's going in, what's coming out, what are you looking for graphically. And then on the right-hand side of the top, given, what are the things that they tell you? What do you know? And then find, what is it you're looking for? What's the answer you're trying to, what's the question you're answer, trying to answer? And then sometimes they'll say, you know, put down what formulas you're using to get there. And now you've got that all organized, then you start the problem. And uh, I've actually heard said people in taking the FE exam, how many people know what I'm talking about? And for the rest of you, um, Fundamentals of Engineering exam is a state-sponsored test that takes you on the way to getting a professional engineer's license. And it's, it's like doing the bar exam for uh, legal guys or, um, you know, it's, it's, it makes you an engineer. You cannot legally practice as a consulting engineer, um, sell your services as an engineer to the public without a license from the state. If somebody went to MIT and didn't have that, they'd be illegal. If you go to Central and you do have that, you're legal. It's it's a uh, doesn't mean that you know more than they do, but you may know more that's relevant than they do. Anyway, the FE exam, um, it's a timed thing, and and you need to to do X many questions in so much time and get a passing grade and all that. And somebody said, you know, in in spite of the amount of time it takes you to draw this little picture, it helps you organize. The rest of the problem goes faster. And so it actually, um, I, I do it all the time myself. It just helps you organize. So three body diagram, it, I've, I've posted in sort of an example problem. Uh, lab reports, I haven't posted that yet. Um, your next your lab tomorrow is uh, going to be sort of a quick one in that it's uh, more uh, energy calculation on uh, how much energy is there taking a shower, how much money do you save in this room, on the lights in this room relative to the thermodynamics uh, lab that we had before the remodel. So uh, I can give you ways to help you figure out how that works. Um, there's basically three types of lab reports that you produce in the course of the class. Um, one of them is the long form full on report. You got a, a, a title page um, and then you have behind it a uh, bunch of sections. Uh, introduction, what are you trying to do? Um, list of equipment. Um, 
the procedure, you got um, what is your data, what are the results, what did you get from the data, what did you calculate are your results, um, discussion, what went on, and conclusion, this is what, this was summarizing it, and then appendix, you did, all those don't have to be multiple pages, but they, you know, you address all of those to make a report. I have had some students that said, they got out and um, went to get a job, and they had one year of experience, and they applied for a job within the company that needed five years experience. And the fact that they were producing reports formally with that uh, to their bosses, they blew off the, oh, you don't need five years, we're going to take you because we like your report. So it's, it's not just me trying to make your life miserable. It's, uh, it can be something that, that helps you in your career doing that format. That's the worst one because it's long form. It's also worse for me because I have to, it's like being an English uh, professor reading, you know, I'm going to be looking for, you know, grammar, not like super bad, but if it's somebody's super bad at grammar, um, there's solutions for that. If you take it to the writing center and, and uh, I, I'll give you back all your points for that sort of thing. So don't let that freak you out. Um, there's a memo. A number of them will be memos. And in a memo, that's like your boss asks you, asks you a question, and you need to answer that question. And you want it within one page, because he's probably not going to have time to turn the page. He just wants the answer to the question. But if he has questions about your answer, you need to back it up with tables and charts behind it. Because you don't have to write a book. You just write one page. And sometimes it's harder to write one page and, and get it concise and everything that needs to be said um, with that one page. So that's another challenge sometimes. But behind that, you might put all your, your data and things. That'll be what goes on with the lab this week. One page memo, a bunch of supporting calculations. And then there's going to be a trip report. And for most of these lab reports, we want facts. We don't want your opinions on things. For a trip report, you're going to answer some questions, and then, you know, what was your impression? What, what, you know, I got sent uh, to um, to evaluate a piece of equipment. There was a couple different ways we could go to get something done, and the boss sent me to Los Angeles, and I went with another guy, and we both looked at like two different companies who were selling different kinds of machine to get the job done, and the question was. Which one should we buy? This one costs more, but it doesn't has these problems. This one costs uh, less, but it's got these other problems. And this has these characteristics that we like, and this one has these characteristics. You, know, you can only buy one of them, which you're going to do. So a trip report, um, it might ask for your opinions, but you also need to state some facts. So there's usually for your labs at the end to direct you, I'll have questions. That's really what you want to focus on, answering the questions at the end of the report, because that's what I'm looking for. Um, so that's that. There's a homework format, approximately. You know, I call it a free body diagram. It doesn't have to be like statics will be telling you all about free body diagrams, but this is just something that's in and out, and this 30% of energy in goes into work, so that means 70% is going to come down here. That's the thing about thermodynamics. What you will find out is you can't be 100% efficient. There's always going to be some, some waste, and there's a, a limit to how efficient you can be, and you will study what, that, what some of those limits are. Um, so, you know, but what they told me was a power plant. I got 100 works units to work out. The efficiency was so much. And then the question was, how much fuel did I need? And how much heat is in the exhaust on that particular problem? That looks like it might actually be, oh, that's from 411. Not from this class. So there's an example of your homework kind of thing. So. <clears throat> What does the catalog say we're going to learn? Uh, properties of pure substances. That's water, becomes steam, 
uh, R134 becomes a, is a refrigerant, goes around the circle. Um, air can be heated and, and compressed. Uh, there's kind of two worlds we're going to deal with in thermodynamics. One is ideal gas laws are going to do all of it, and it's, it's all about those formulas. And when we analyze gas engines, diesel engines, gas turbines, um, auto cycle, diesel cycle, Brayton cycle, uh, those are all in the realm of ideal gas. Yes? I'm just going to have to say, now I have autism, and I sent you the DSS thing, and people are setting it off right now, constantly clicking and popping things, where I'm having a migraine being used right now, and I can't even look at the screen of these lights. Interesting. Yeah. And it's the same strain that I found out because of teachers, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Albert Einstein, and Tom Simpson have, and I've had over half a student body to call me and have them return for it. Mm. Well, don't know what we do about the clicks. And Can things. everyone please try and control it? Because I've already also had a teacher just tell me whether you have a recorder, just use that and put in your forms and flip it and just sit in a class and not hear anything. Yeah, I don't know how to deal with that one. I, I understand. So, yeah, try not to click. Or talk to you. Yeah, that stuff. Um, we also we are recording, so uh, maybe that you can can it, you know that's recording from up here, so that might be helpful too. Um, pure substance. We got ideal gas side of things, and we've got um, I guess it's called phase change side of things. Now um, phase changing. The phase change throws things funky. You can't just use formulas as well, so you end up with a lot of tables that you have to deal with. So that's for steam and refrigeration, rank and cycle, and uh, I guess refrigeration is a reverse rank and cycle. If it's phase change, you take the steam, you condense it into water, you pump it back up uh, to pressure, you expand it again. That's that phase change cycle we call rank and cycle. So those are like two different those two ways of analyzing things don't, uh, they're, they're difficult to be different from. Uh, we're going to look at the first and second law of thermodynamics. First law says uh, how much energy can we use? That's like conservation of energy. Second law is um, not only how much energy, but What's the quality of it? How do we measure how good it is? There's as much energy in uh, a swimming pool that's 82 degrees as there is in, like, you know, a gallon of gasoline. But you can't use the energy in the swimming pool because it's, it's gone to a sort of a, a lower quality state. You can't use that energy to make a car go or make a steam. You, you, you've lowered its quality to how useful it is. So that's sort of what that's about. And we won't. Talk about in those terms, but that's what it's about. Um, I don't think you'll gas is space change. Um, Carnot cycle is turns out the limit to how efficient something can be for a heat engine. Turns out it's not just about heat engines. It's uh, chemistry also uses um, um, uh, I'll get to that when we get to that, but it's, 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 there's a limit to how much efficient something can be. Um, we're talking steam and refrigeration. We'll have a worksheet on chemical reactions and combustion. And then we'll talk about heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, which is a, um, a whole field of study, a whole field of uh, Careers, we, and we have a number of people that are going into the mechanical contracting uh, companies, which is like that has to do with uh, building energy. There's actually more energy spent on heating and cooling buildings than there is on cars and trains and planes and buses going places. If you think about this campus, how much energy it takes just to keep these buildings going. Uh, 
Now, that's a lot of energy. If you can save 1% of that energy, you've probably saved more energy than you'll spend in your whole life. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So that's what our topics are. Our textbook is, um, I see a few of them around. I know that the bookstore didn't have as many as copies as there are students, but it's, um, uh, there are some students getting from other places, so anyway, don't delay getting this one. Um, it's the fourth edition of the Fundamentals of Thermal Fluid Sciences. The good news on this book, no, bad news first, it's expensive, a couple hundred bucks. The good news is it's for MET 314, MET 315 is also contained within it, and MET 316. Uh, everyone doesn't have to take heat transfer, but everyone will have to take fluid mechanics after this. And so it has at least two classes in that book. And they, they dovetail. They're all about energy. And you know, we're going to be looking at how much energy does, does a certain amount, a kilogram of steam or whatever, have in it at a certain temperature pressure. Well, then how you get it from point A to point B, there's losses as it goes down the pipe. That's what the fluid talks about. You start with this much pressure, you end up with that much pressure. Uh, Stuff like that. The topics fit together. And um, yeah, I've had some people at the end of 314, God, I hated this class. I'm going to sell my book. And then they come on the first day of 315. What book do I need? Well, the one you just sold. Do you make anybody any money when you buy a book and sell it and then buy it back again? Somebody makes money, but it's not you. <laughs> So how's it all fit in? Um, for solid things, you got statics. What are the forces on something? If you put your elbow on not in the middle of the table, there's four legs, and they aren't carrying the same load. How much load is on which leg? Uh, strength in materials, 312, is now that you know what the load is in the leg, how much stress is in the material, and how does that compare to the strength of the material as far as how much stress can it handle? So those those 311, 312 sort of fit together that way. Um, 327 is dynamics. Statics is about stuff that's just static, not moving. Dynamics is about something in motion. So uh, that's what those are about. That's all sort of basic physics, but it's starting to get into material science in 312. 314, thermodynamics is fluid properties and energy, thermal energy changes, how much energy, thermal energy is, is in a fluid as it goes through a process cycle. Next class, fluid dynamics. What about the kinetic potential energy changes in the fluid? Unrelated to what the temperature is. What if it's just, you got the fluid at whatever temperature, you're gonna move it? You know, how much pressure does it take to make it go through the pipe at some speed? Things like that, hydroelectric uh, things, that's fluid. And then heat transfer, not everyone has to take this, but this is how are you getting the energy into the fluid from the boiler into the steam? How do you predict that? Or solar energy, how do you collect it? How much can you expect to collect? Or uh, uh, how, how, mu how much do you have, to, how much insulation do you need to maintain to limit the energy flow out? So these three classes are in the book. Everybody takes the first two. And frankly, heat transfer is one of the topics in the FE test. It's a, it's a basic topic. Um, but you kind of have to pick and choose. So what is this course about? How much energy does extreme, a, a cool stream contain? How much energy can you extract from it? In a power plant, uh, the waste heat coming out of it is still warm. In your engine, you have you buy gasoline. The gasoline burns the engine nice and hot. Uh, would you want to like just grab the exhaust pipe when you're done? It's hot. That's waste energy. If you could make it be colder, 
you could, you know, keep more energy, more energy converted and less energy wasted. But sometimes for various conditions, it, you just you just have to go with it. Um, in your car, your engine's probably at best 25% efficient and half of the rest of the heat goes out through the exhaust and half of the rest of it goes out through your radiator or, or you know, the, the water cooling, the engine block itself. Uh, that's just the engine at peak efficiency. If it goes down the road, it might get more like 5% of your fuel energy actually moves the car. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so we're going to look at uh, steam and gas turbines, um, internal external combustion engine, combustion energy, chemistry, refrigerators, heat pumps, um, and then the HVAC. Turns out the amount of moisture in the air has a huge effect on um, your your loading, or the amount of energy it takes to cool down something. And then we analyze the heat engines. And we can look, based on our analysis, if we can do an analysis and sort of match it to reality, then if we know uh, it's working and people have done that for us. Now we're going to look at how they model these things. If you know the mathematics of the modeling, you can come up with how do we make it more efficient. And for things like the gasoline engine, it turns out compression ratio uh, drives everything. If you get your compression ratio up, it's more efficient. That's why diesels are at 20 to 1 compression are 30% more efficient than gasoline engines at 8 or 9. If you bring the compression up on a gasoline engine, though, with, with air fuel mixtures, you get pre ignition and you got, now you get practical problems, pinging, uh, that sort of thing. So there's a limit to what you can do with gas engines because of the air fuel mixture problem. So anyway, if you can, if you know how to analyze it, then you can look at the analysis and say what matters. How can I improve it? Uh, that's why we model these things. So, and I'm going to cut to the chase here on what the, the laws of thermodynamics. Um, after they invented the first law, they realized they had to invent something so that they could. Um, Justify it. So basically, first law is conservation of energy. They give it. They they'll give you a bunch of different words on how it, but it's energy is conserved. It may change forms. It may go from you know potential energy in a fuel to heat energy and expanded gases and all that. But it's conserved. It goes somewhere. We are accountants. Which way did it go? How much went to turn it into work? How much went into exhaust? And when we know how to analyze it, we can say, well, if we do this, we could take some of the heat out of the exhaust and turn it into work. But it's all about accounting. So first law, conservation of energy. Second law, they really were this one screwball. I don't know. I, I don't even know if I have a good grip on it. But basically what it boils down to is there's a quality to the energy. If you have some hot gas at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you can do a lot more with it than if you have a lot more gas at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They might have the same amount of energy available, but it's not as as useful. So is that second law pretty much trying to boil down to energy density? No. No. It's not about density. It's about how useful it is, how much, yeah. Um, there's a property called entropy they use to define uh, basically it's how much energy you can't use. So if you think of a um, efficiency um, equation, it might be total energy minus the waste energy. Total energy minus the exhaust energy equals how much you converted. What it comes down to? It's really the, the there are thermodynamic limits on how much waste energy you're going to have to have because you can't get below ambient temperatures, for instance. Gotcha. Um, like like in, in a power plant, you might be able to run at higher efficiency 
if you happened to be on the Arctic Ocean and you could get water that was below 32 degrees or something. But if you did that, you'd probably heat up the Arctic Ocean and it wouldn't be that, and, and it's not going to stay that way for long. And, but you're stuck with, you need to transfer the heat to a colder source, and the source you have is at 52 degrees or something. I like to think about, in, in a practical term, uh, imagine um, Wanapum Dam over the hill here. There's water that comes down into it, and it is at 1,600 feet, and the tail water is, say, I mean, I don't know, I'm making up these numbers, but say that the pool height is 1,600 feet, and the tail water on the backside of the turbine is 1,500 feet. So you got 100 feet of, of potential energy for that water running through it. Well, what about the other 1,500 feet? Why don't we just dig a hole that's another 1,500 feet deep and let it wash all the way in there? Now, man, we've increased the efficiency or the power output by 16 times. But now what do you do with the water in the hole? And so you're just you're stuck. So there's a floor to how much energy you can, even though you're still at 1,500 feet when the water comes out of the turbine, there's a limitation to how much of that energy you can use. Now it turns out we're going to take that and take it all the way down to the Columbia, uh, all the way out to the ocean by putting a series of dams, and each dam is going to take a little bit more out of it. But that's kind of, with thermodynamics, you've got that same issue, and with property entropy, tell us that quality. We can only get that 1,500 feet worth as our, our floor. We can't get more efficient. We can't get more power out of it. It's, there's power there. There's energy there. It just have to go somewhere else to, to deal with it. Uh, in thermodynamic systems, they have something called cogeneration, where maybe you do have your your um, you're generating power with uh, say gas turbine, uh, and the exhaust of the gas turbine is really hot. Well, now instead instead of having another plant somewhere, another furnace somewhere else burning some more fuel to heat the building. Maybe you generate the electricity, and then you put that generating plant close to an industrial park and use the exhaust from the gas turbine to heat water at a lower temperature. We don't need a 1,000 degree temperature to heat this room, do we? So you can cool down the exhaust, use that heat instead of having another furnace somewhere, use that heat. That's a, a cogeneration. You're generating, and you're also using the waste heat somewhere and you can get the net efficiency higher than than your limits because you found a, a use for the lower grade uh, heat. Uh, so there's there's things you can do. Uh, that doesn't really make that that generator system more efficient, but it makes the entire system better use of energy and it's more efficient. So uh, to start the uh, our topics here. Oh, you know, there's one more topic I have. Oh, maybe we'll do that tomorrow. I have a uh, a quiz, and the quiz is basically what's what's your name? Did you transfer here? It's, it's, it's no reading involved. This is ought to be off the top of your head, but we'll do that one tomorrow. Um, So what is this thing called energy that we're going to be messing with? Uh, energy is the capacity to perform work. Yeah. Work is actually defined as, as force times distance. And energy is, is something that could be converted into work. That's what they're, they're saying there. So if I push on this with all of my might, how far is the wall moving? Not, not very far. Am I, I, I'm, I'm making effort, definite effort, but it's not work because it's not doing anything. If I take this chair and it's got some friction and, and mass and whatever, and it takes me a half a pound to push it, and I push it half a pound to 20 feet, one half times 20. Wouldn't that be 10 foot pounds? We got 10 foot pounds of work I just did. I probably spent more effort over here, but I didn't do any work. And I just did 10 foot pounds of work there. 
So force times distance. Now it turns out they figured out BTU is is 778 foot pounds. And if I push that into half the pounds, however far, you know, 1,400, 1,500 feet, whatever that is. Um, probably whatever's slowing it down, the friction in the wheels would generate heat. If you take your hands, and you, everybody put your hands together, and then move them back and forth. Are they getting colder? Are, you have force, you're, because you've got friction, and you've got a force, force times friction times distance, you got a normal force, you got a, you know, you're, that force is generating heat, and that's how much heat the BTU is, is if you did that 778 distance times time, that's generating heat. Uh, likewise, one joule, if you take one newton worth of force, go one meter, and you've created a joule. These, these are our English and metric units that we're going to be using. And then that's energy. That's how much power is how fast. So one joule per second is a lot. <clears throat> you can have, and it turns out one volt times one amp is a lot. They're, they all kind of electricity and and it all sort of, if, if you go to Europe and look at, go to buy a car, you want to know how much power it has, they're not going to tell you horsepower. Maybe in, in England. I don't think even in England anymore. They'll tell you how many kilowatts the engine power is. And it's not electric. That's that's uh, the measure. And a horsepower turns out 550 foot-pounds every second gets you one horsepower is worth of power. Uh, and if you do the numbers, it turns out 746 watts uh, works out to one horsepower. So three quarter, um, uh, three quarter kilowatt is one horsepower. And then there's units. And I know you, you guys have had physics, so this shouldn't all be new. But um, I don't know if they're still, are they still, uh, if they still use, they might still use slugs somewhere in, in like, I yeah, hope not. In statics. Yeah, I was going to say, that last year we had two slugs at Walsh Um We're not going to use slugs. It's really just a stupid. It's just because they invented pounds before they invented acceleration. But you know, some of these things are the same. This is just sort of how things correlate. The pound mass is not a pound force, but there is a correlation, oddly. Um, how are we doing? Kind of um, there's a few uh, fun. Oh, God, isn't this fun? There are fun uh, correlations. A pint's a pound the world around. One pound mass is 16 uh, ounces. 16 fluid ounces is one pint. One fluid ounce is one. One fluid ounce of water is one ounce. Weight, mass, whatever. Um, if you take one pound of water, one pound mass, and take it up one degree Fahrenheit, that is one BTU. That's really where that got defined. That's 778 foot pounds is backed out of this relationship. It's really, it's all based on water. Um, if I have a pound mass of water and I put it on the tabletop, it will, gravity will give it one pound of force. So that's, that's basically, so what's a pound? Well, a pound's a pound. And then when they came up with, it's not one G, it's 32.2 feet per second, so that's where the slugs came in. Um, one pound force is one pound mass times gravity, but one pound force is one pound mass times 32.2 feet per second. This is an, this, if, if you got acceleration involved, you're going to be screwed if, if you're going to be off by 32.2 all the time if you don't differentiate between force and mass here. They find one slug times one foot per second gets you one pound. That's where slugs came from. So, all right, that's enough torture for today.
Yes, sir. I told you in the summer. Um, you gave me code for um, the lab. 